Order. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Prime Minister. I refer the Prime Minister to an answer given by the Treasurer at 2.23 p.m. in this House yesterday uh, to a question as to whether the new fee for guaranteeing bank deposits over $1 million will be compulsory. And the Treasurer's response, and I quote, the very simple answer is that the fee will be paid by all depositors in the deposit-taking institutions that are regulated by APRA, and the fee will be paid either by the depositor or the bank." End quote. I also refer to the Prime Minister's subsequent observation in question time yesterday, and I quote, I stand by everything the Treasurer has said. Prime Minister, does this compulsory deposit tax apply from the time of the Treasurer's announcement yesterday? Good question. The Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, when the Treasurer uh, introduced the uh, financial claims scheme into the parliament, I think it was Wednesday of last week, the Treasurer made absolutely clear at that time that the uh, interrelationship between the financial claims scheme on the one hand, that is the guarantee on bank deposits, and the guarantees for term wholesale funding uh, would be coordinated in the implementation arrangements between both the bank uh, and, the, um, and the Treasury and others. And that is the process which has unfolded over the last uh, week or so, as is normal. The Treasurer indicated that was the process. We've had the regulators at work on this process. That is the normal thing to do because not only uh, are there complex negotiations on implementation between the regulators on the one hand, um, and uh, including the Treasury, but also the banks themselves and also uh, relevant international jurisdictions. So, Mr Speaker, these matters uh, will be uh, resolved and published in their finality when uh, these, um, these uh, deliberations by the regulators with the banks will be concluded. That is the proper way to do things, and that's what we indicated when the, when the um, Treasurer introduced his legislation last week. Can I say this to the Leader of the Opposition, who finds this entire exercise entirely amusing? The basic facts are these. The government acted decisively Order. in the middle of a financial crisis. Secondly, what happened was Order. that we Prime took Minister, action to— Prime Minister will resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition, on point of order. This is a very simple question about the commencement date of a new tax announced yesterday. The Prime Minister order should address the himself to that. The Opposition will resume his seat. The Prime Minister will respond to the question. The Prime Minister. As the Honourable Member knows, in my, answer to the first, uh, my previous uh, answer to his question, I am dealing with the process through which the final determination of the arrangements for the premiums to be attached to term wholesale funding arrangements uh, and those which may apply uh, to uh, depositors uh, at the upper range, beyond a million dollars or slightly beyond that. And uh, in the normal course of events, that will be determined after proper consultation with the regulators. That's the proper way to do business. I'd say this, though, to the Leader of the Opposition, having answered his question, is um, we on this side of the House have taken decisive action to ensure that we have soothed financial Order. markets. Order. We have taken decisive action because every mum and dad in the gallery would like to know this today, that their deposits are guaranteed. And under the actions of this government, that guarantee has been provided. And furthermore, as a consequence of that action, we have also seen, through the other actions taken by the government, downward pressure on interest rates. Now, the Leader of the Opposition doesn't want to hear this, but what has happened in the period since the government took this action? We have seen not only uh, confidence increasingly restored when we had so many people, mums and dads out there, concerned about the banks, having watched all that negative news come down their television sets from abroad. We acted with a decisive uh, policy statement on the guarantee. Those opposite maintain wedded to this position they would only make a guarantee available to deposits up to $100,000. Leaving, therefore, unguaranteed, unprotected, according to Liberal Party policy, 40 per cent of all deposit accounts. 40 per cent of all deposit accounts. That's, that's quite extraordinary. 40 per cent of deposits. And so what I'd say, what I'd say to those opposite is very simply this: that on this question, on this question, those opposite need to uh, reflect long and hard on the consequences of the actions which the government has taken in providing confidence to mums and dads out there in the community. Secondly, can I say this? On the question of um, the impact which these decisions by the government has had on the banks, 
Look what's happened with interest rates in the last week or so. We've had all four major banks bring down interest rates by between 20 and 25 basis points. And if you look at the statements which have been put forward by the NAB and by the ANZ, what have they said? They've said, this is the NAB, policy measures announced by the Australian government earlier this month have started to have a positive effect. We hope to be in a position where we can pass on further interest rate cuts to our customers. That is a direct consequence of what the government has done. Unwelcome news on the part of the Leader of the Opposition. I would say a good news when it comes to a good piece of news when it comes to those out there with mortgages. Listen to what the ANZ Chief Executive Officer has said. We are pleased to deliver on the promise we made in January to pass on reductions in funding costs as we see market conditions easings. And then he goes on to say, policy measures both here in Australia and around the world have restored some confidence in the global investment community, and this is resulting in an easing of high wholesale funding rates." Unquote. These are the concrete actions which have flowed as a consequence of what the government did Sunday a week ago. The Leader of the Opposition, out there with his own policy on, um, on guarantees of deposit, up to $100,000 but not, not beyond that, leaving everyone else out there without guarantee. On the one hand, that's his approach. Our approach, strong, decisive action, which has not only helped in terms of confidence in the general community, mums and dads concerned about their deposits, but also in terms of the cost of finance for mortgages. Can I say this? That we, our action has also been supported by the Treasury. It has been supported by the Reserve Bank. And the Reserve Bank, the leader of the National Party, laughs at this. I would suggest that those opposite should not laugh when it comes to further undermining of this country's independent financial institutions. The APRA, the Reserve Bank, said the other day Order. that the decisions taken by the government were sensible and the RBA supported them. Furthermore, Dr John Laker of APRA said the government's deposit term and funding guarantee, which APRA fully supports, has calmed what was a growing disquiet on the part of some depositors. So put all these things together. You have the Australian Prudential Regulatory Authority backing the government's actions when it took its decision. You have the Reserve Bank of Australia backing the government's actions when it took its decision. You had the Secretary of the Treasury doing oh, the same. Wow. You had the mainstream commercial banks saying that because of these actions, the actual cost of finance flowing through to consumers has been able to be reduced, and they themselves saying so explicitly in their statements. That is what the government has done. We have the support of these independent financial regulators. Those opposite, led by the Leader of the Opposition, has spent his entire time undermining the integrity and the independence of these independent institutions. Yesterday, the Leader of the Liberal Party, or earlier this week, the Leader of the Liberal Party uh, came to the dispatch box and said— Order. The Prime Minister will resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Relevance. The question was about a date. We haven't got to that yet. Order. The Prime Minister has the call. Mr, Mr. Speaker, order. Mr. Speaker order. the Leader of the Opposition is sensitive on the attacks which he has come under legitimately because of his attacks on the independent financial regulators. We know that Malcolm believes that Malcolm knows best. We actually believe the Reserve Bank knows better. We actually believe that the Prudential Regulatory Authority knows better. We actually also believe Order. that the Secretary of the Treasury knows better. So here we have the alternative Prime Minister of Australia standing up in this place and calling into question whether the Secretary of the Treasury should be dismissed. That's what he said. Order. He refused to come in and repudiate that. He then unleashes the dogs of war in the Senate yesterday through Senator Abetz in a scripted script from his own office, where Senator Abetz again intacts the integrity of the Secretary Order. of the Treasury. And what Order. did the Leader of the Opposition do about that? Nothing whatsoever. We had the member for North Sydney earlier this week questioning whether the word of the Secretary of Treasury counted for anything at all. Can I say to those opposite that Aston. was just phase one? Phase two, the member, member for, for Canning Cowan. this morning, attacking the integrity and the independence of the Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia. That's Order. what you did. That's what Remember you did, Dawson. and you did so in orchestration, I presume, with the Leader of the Opposition's office. Can I, say, can I say to the member for Canning, acting again as one of the dogs of war unleashed, oh, unleashed the member by— for, The Prime Minister will resume his seat. The member for Canning on a point of order. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, the opposition, uh, the opposition uh, member, uh, member for Grain— Order! Order! Member for Grain. Order! We'll do the member for Grain order. then, Mr the Speaker. The member has the call. Has tabled my letter of apology. Order. The Prime Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition, of course, has not retracted.
his comments earlier in the week when he canvassed the possibility of dismissing the Secretary of the Treasury because he disapproves of the Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, he then unleashes the dogs of war in the Senate to launch a further attack on the Secretary of the Treasury. Finds that entirely amusing. His office today then unleashed the member for Canning to launch an attack on the Reserve Bank of Australia. And uh, his, remarks, his remarks said that Glenn Stevens had been caught out. He put up the interest rates before the election, during the election, when the rest of the world were bringing down interest rates. In other words, in an orchestrated attack by the Liberal Party, attacking the independence and the integrity of the Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia attacking the Secretary of the Treasury, attacking the Reserve Bank Governor, and earlier, of course, we had the attack on ASIC itself on the question of the future of short selling. These are three of the principal arms of Australia's independent financial regulators. And what we have is the Leader of the Liberal Party launching a short-term political attack on their independence. I would say to the Leader of the Liberal Party this. If you have any interest in the long term— Order. The Prime Minister will resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition. Yeah, thank you, Mr Speaker. I know it's a long time since I asked the question, but it was about a date. Order. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. The Prime Minister has the call and will bring his answer to a conclusion. Mr Speaker, what we've, had, uh, what we've, had, from the, um, what we've had from the Leader of the Opposition, the alternative Prime Minister of Australia, is an attack on our independent Order institutions. The, the Leader of the Opposition, Malcolm Turnbull, so arrogant, so out of touch and now so out of control that he Order. can't even bring himself to support the independent the financial institutions of Australia in the midst of a global financial crisis. I conclude with this. In a global financial crisis— Order. Order. In a, I would say this to the Leader of the Opposition. In the midst of a global financial crisis, leadership requires supporting the independence of our financial and economic regulators. Can I say the abandonment of leadership, as you have demonstrated, lies in taking short-term political pot shots at them. I would say to the Leader of the Opposition, get behind our independent regulators, support the confidence that we need in this economy for the future, rather than simply pandering to your own short-term political advantage. Arrogant out of control, out of touch. Before giving the call to the member for Flynn, Lord, I inform the House that we have present in the gallery this afternoon Mr Clary Miller, a former member for Wide Bay and a former, and might I add, respected Deputy Speaker of this House. To Clary, I say on behalf of the House, I extend to you a warm welcome. The member for Flynn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer outline for the House why it is so important that confidence in the regulators is not undermined in these uncertain global times? The Treasurer. Yes, I uh, thank the uh, member. Uh, for his uh, question, Mr. Speaker, because in uncertain global times, confidence in key economic institutions, in key financial institutions, and in key, regula key regulators is absolutely paramount, and that is particularly the case. Particularly the case, given given that we are in the midst of the worst financial market uh, <laughs> crisis since the Great Depression, Mr. Speaker, and because of that, it is indeed surprising, I think, that the opposition have, over the last 48 hours, gone out of their way to slur some of our finest public servants and to trash some of our finest economic institutions. Mr. Speaker. And just think about that for a moment. Given what is going on around the world, why would the opposition choose this time to attack the head of the Treasury, an independent public service department headed by a man who has worked for both sides of politics, has been with that department all of his working life, why would they do that in the middle of a global financial crisis, Mr Speaker? Now, of course, the Leader of the Opposition was given the opportunity to come into the House and apologise, apologise for that attack, but he simply wasn't man enough, Mr Speaker. But what is worse? What is worse is that because the, the, the Secretary Treasury had the temerity to say that regulators supported the government guarantee on deposits, he had to be trashed. So what happened 
after that. Well, what happened after that, uh, Mr. Speaker? What happened after that? What happened after that was that Senator Abetz, Senator Abetz in the Senate, a senior member of the opposition front bench, attacked the honesty of the Treasury Secretary in the middle, in the middle of a global financial crisis. And he certainly didn't apologise, Mr. Speaker. And of course, what has happened today? What happened today was something far worse. They sent out the member for Canning to attack the Reserve Bank governor personally. That's what they did. To accuse the Reserve Bank governor of political bias because he put Order up interest rates prior to the Order last the election. The Treasurer resume his seat. The Treasurer resume his seat. The member for Canning on a point of order. Mr Speaker, it, it is not relevant for the uh, minister after an apology has been tabled to, to dredge up the same issue again. Yeah. Order. 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 The, the member for Canning has other avenues of uh, recourse in the in the in the in the chamber, but I do note that this has been an occurrence that's occurred to other members, especially when they're members of the opposition, where despite despite uh, actions being taken by them or corrections being made, the comments have continued. And I just make that as a notation. But I simply say to the member for Canning, he has other courses of action in the chamber that, to address the problem that he perceives that he has. The Treasurer. So the Treasurer. Yes, Mr Speaker. The member for Canning not only attacked the Reserve Bank Governor for political bias, he then accused him of creating chaos in the Australian economy. That's what he did. And I'm pleased he's had the sense to come into the House and to apologise. But that's not enough. What is required is a complete repudiation of his statements by the Leader of the Opposition. That is what is required. And what is required is an apology from the Leader of the Opposition for the slurs that have been cast on the Treasury Secretary and for his personal attack on the Treasury Secretary. Mr. Speaker. That, is, that is what is required. But, you see, the Leader of the Opposition said this financial crisis had all just been hyped up. It wasn't all that serious. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about its impact on the stock market. Don't worry about its impact on our financial institutions. So I guess he wouldn't be worried about the independence of our regulators or the independence of our Reserve Bank. We on this side of the House strongly support the regulators. We strongly support our impartial public servants, and all sides of the House should be doing this at a time of global financial crisis. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. And I refer the Prime Minister to advice from the Governor of the Reserve Bank to the Treasury Secretary, Dr Henry, on 17 October, in which the Governor said, and I quote, not only must there be a cap, but the lower the better. Given this advice, does the Prime Minister agree with the Treasurer's statement on national television four days later, on 21 October, when he said, and I quote, the Reserve Bank is not arguing for a cap? The Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, as I indicated in my answer to the uh, Leader of the Opposition in his first question today, uh, the process in which the uh, Reserve Bank and the other regulators, including the Treasury, have been engaged uh, since Sunday a week ago has been to resolve the implementation detail of, first of all, the premium to be attached to the term wholesale funding arrangements for the banks, uh, and secondly, uh, to resolve the implementation arrangements concerning uh, the deposit guarantee. Uh, the interrelationship of those two matters was explicitly canvassed at the time that the Treasurer introduced the financial claims legislation into the House, last Wednesday. Secondly, since then, as you would normally expect, 
There is a lot of exchange between the Reserve Bank and the other regulators, including the Secretary of the Treasury, on the detail of that. That is the normal way in which public policy is conducted. And once these matters have been resolved in finality, they will be made public, as I have said repeatedly in this dispatch box and as the Treasurer has said repeatedly in this dispatch box as well. But I would say to the Opposition this. This entire process, in the midst of a global financial crisis, would be made much easier had we had bipartisan political support for the key financial institutions of Australia. And in the space of one week, we have had the Leader of the Opposition launch a political attack on the Secretary of the Treasury. We have had an orchestrated continuation of that attack by his senators in Senate estimates yesterday. On top of that, we have had an orchestrated attack on the Governor of the Reserve Bank on the doors this morning and the independence of the Reserve Bank. And what we had up until now no single statement of repudiation at the dispatch box, let alone apology, by the alternative Prime Minister of Australia. You know something? This is also a, a pattern of behaviour. Order. The Prime Minister will resume his seat. The member for Dixon on a point of order. Mr Speaker, on relevance, sir, this question went to a statement by, made by the Treasurer, which contradicted that which has been provided by the Reserve Bank Governor. The Prime Minister Order. has not answered Order. in any way that part of the question. Order. The member will resume his seat. The Prime Minister is responding to the question. I will listen carefully to him. The uh, Prime Mr. Minister. Mr Speaker, in my answer to the question, I said that these matters would be determined uh, when the, um, the regulators have concluded their discussions internally and with the banks and with other relevant financial institutions when it will be placed in the public domain. That goes to the substance of the question which has been asked. Secondly, I have said that the entire process— well, the, Order. The Prime Minister resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition on relevance. Mr. Speaker, the question asked the Prime. Well, it's a, yes, it is relevance, Mr. I'm complaining about lack of relevance. The, spe the question asked the Prime Minister to address a statement by the Governor of the Reserve Bank and a statement by the Treasurer. What he's doing is giving another lengthy description the of, of, of the his long process. The Leader of Opposition will resume his seat. The Prime Minister is responding to, comment to matters that were related to those comments. The Prime Minister. Well, the Leader of the Opposition may be unhappy with the answer. He normally is when it doesn't suit his short-term political purposes. Order. But what we're on about on this side of the House is the long-term interests of the economy of this nation. And that's the difference. And I would say to the alternative Prime Minister of the country, as he would describe himself, that one of the qualifications for office in this country is to support the independence of our financial regulators. A quali quality and a character element that we have not seen evidence in his behaviour this last week at all. Can I say, can I say to the Leader of the Opposition that he was a member of the Howard government, and this goes to a question of a pattern of behaviour by the Howard government in relation to public servants who don't toe the political line. Remember the attack on the then Secretary of the Treasury and the now Secretary of the Treasury when he made an internal speech in the Treasury about why Treasury should be included more in the then government's deliberations on climate change and water. What was the response to that? They unleashed the dogs of war, but much worse. And the member for Higgins knows the detail of this, and he should hang his head in shame, because it happened under his watch. The bonus which would normally be attracted to the um, salary of the um, Secretary of the Treasury at that time was then. Order. The Prime Minister is you may see the member for Dixon on a point of order. Mr Speaker, on relevance, this question goes to a statement made by the Treasurer which did not reconcile with the advice that was received by the Reserve Bank Governor. This has nothing to do with what the Prime Minister has order. gone on with for six or seven minutes now. He has will, to answer that part of the question. The member for Dixon will resume his seat. Prime Minister. Thanks very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And so the independence uh, and reputation of our financial regulators is key and critical to each of the matters which the Leader of the Opposition has raised in his question today. And furthermore, the maintenance of the independence of the regulators is doubly important. And when we have a pattern of behaviour, which occurred when the member for Higgins was Treasurer, when the then Secretary of the Treasury had his bonus cut because he had the temerity to deliver a speech which didn't meet with the political support of those opposite, what we see the today is Dixon. a continuation of that pattern of behaviour. This government has a great relationship member with the for, Treasury. Member, the Prime Minister will resume his seat. The member for Ryan. Mr Speaker, relevance. Member for this is Ryan will resume his seat. Sorry, what was that comment? No, what was the other bit? Well, order.
before we continue, I think that the House should just um, maybe all of us should take a collective deep breath. I think that this illustrates the fact that perhaps both sides have not yet quite used to that they've, they've swapped sides and that there is not a real will to change the nature of question time. And that it might be something that if people are aggrieved around the House, that they might think about whether they would like the Procedures Committee to look at these matters. I remind the House that the standing orders say a lot about questions. They say one particular statement about answers, and that is relevance. The relevance does not have to be interpreted by some specificity in the eyes of the questioner, and that has been the case for some long time. The Prime Minister will respond to the question and we will get to a conclusion of his answer. Very much, Mr. Speaker. So, on the matters raised by the Leader of the Opposition in his question, uh, as I said before in the earlier part of my answer, uh, the, final detail, the final detail of the premiums which will be attached to term wholesale funding and those which attach to the guarantees for deposits will be released once the regulators have properly concluded their discussions with the banks and other relevant foreign jurisdictions. And what I've been seeking to make, uh, Mr. Speaker, is simply the associated point. To maintain the integrity of that process, we must maintain and support the integrity of the institutions which are party to that process, one of which is the Treasury. Has the, has the Prime Minister the member for Dixon. Well, on relevance, sir, Mr. Speaker, this goes to a statement made by the Treasurer as to whether or not he has lied to the Australian people. The Prime Minister is refusing to answer that part of the question, and it's completely unacceptable that he will not be accountable to this parliament. I will just illustrate, without taking any action on the, on the member for Dixon, that that was not a point of order, and he knows that in the way it was. Con in the way it was constructed. I am suggesting that the House take a collective deep breath and get on with the business. I will not now allow people to approach the dispatch box and debate a point of order. The Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, I ask that that be withdrawn. Sorry. If Sorry, in, 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 his, in the member for Dixon's repeat, what he claimed to be repeating of the question, he did use an expression that should be withdrawn. Member for Barker, I ask the member for Dixon to withdraw. I withdraw, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for Dixon. Prime Minister. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, we, the government, uh, in our relationship with the Treasury, respect its independence. Um, we respect the independence of the financial regulators. That's very important in dealing with the grave challenges we face in the global financial crisis right now. And my simple appeal to those opposite is they do the same. The member for Ford. Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer update the House on his consultations with the financial sector on the implementation of the retail deposits and wholesale funds guarantees. The Treasurer. Yes, I, uh, I thank the member for Ford uh, for his question, Mr. Speaker, because the government is committed to protecting uh, all depositors in these uncertain times. And following our announcement on October 12, we've seen a marked improvement in the, op in the operation of financial markets, with spreads falling, resulting in cuts in mortgage rates. Mr. Speaker, this morning, I think, in, in estimates, Mr. John Laker uh, from APRA had this to say. He said the government's deposit term and funding guarantee, which APRA fully supports, has calmed what was a growing disquiet on the part of depositors. Mr. Speaker. And when the second reading legislation was introduced into the House, I made it very clear to the House that fine-tuning would take place uh, in the days ahead. And that is, of course, what has been happening. That is what the RBA, APRA and ASIC have been doing. It is what the government has been doing. We have been consulting widely on this question and continuing a series of consultations uh, through today and tomorrow on all of these matters. 
with banks, building societies and credit unions, with financial market participants and with those institutions that are not covered by the government guarantee. We do take our responsibilities very seriously and we are liaising very closely uh, with all of our regulators. And we are doing this to ensure deposits are protected and to ensure the ongoing efficient operation of financial markets. Now, as for the detail, which have been the subject of some comment, the level above which large deposits will be treated as wholesale funding, how much the fee will be, how a fee will be structured, would it be flat, would it be tiered, who would pay, whether it was compulsory or opt-in, all of those things, all of those things have been on the agenda, Mr Speaker. Order. And all of these things, the all of these been things have been, been on answered. the agenda, have been highlighted yeah. by me both publicly and in the meetings with regulators and with industry, Mr Speaker. These are commercially sensitive matters. This is where, Mr Speaker, the opposition really don't get it. This, this material is commercially sensitive. It is being worked out thoroughly. It has been worked out in accord with the wishes of our regulators. It has been worked out with industry. We will reach a sensible conclusion in a timely manner in the interest of a stable financial system. Order. Before calling the Leader of the Opposition, I inform the House that we have present in the gallery this afternoon the Honourable Bob Sneath, the President of the South Australian Legislative Council. On behalf of the House, I extend to him a very warm welcome. I can indicate to him it's pretty warm down here. The Leader of the Opposition. Yes, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. By leave, I move that this House censures the Prime Minister and the Treasurer for their inept and incompetent economic and financial management since coming to office and, in particular, failing to react responsibly and effectively to the global financial crisis, establishing an unlimited free deposit guarantee scheme which, in the words of the Reserve Bank Governor himself, is creating serious dislocation in the financial system, ignoring the warning of the Reserve Bank Governor when he wrote to the Treasury Secretary last Friday that, and I quote, we have been going around and around on this, but I think we need to get something out to the market soon. Expediting the passage through the Parliament of a deposits guarantee law, which at the very moment the Treasurer delivered his second reading speech, he knew, did, he knew but did not say was misconceived and in need of drastic amendment. Announcing in the course of question time yesterday a new deposits tax which would impose a massive cost increase on Australian banks a cost they would seek to recover by increased interest rates and fees. When the global financial instability became a crisis, failing to directly consult the Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia on a central element of the government's response, which falls directly within the Governor's responsibilities because it affects the systemic stability of Australia's financial system, and right from the beginning of this year, consistently putting its short-term political strategy ahead of responsible economic management by talking up inflation and talking down the economy, thereby undermining business and consumer confidence and increasing inflationary expectations, thereby causing the Reserve Bank to increase interest rates, and attempting to run the Australian economy on the basis of the 24-hour news cycle, causing the Prime Minister to develop policy on the run without due and proper evidence, proper analysis and proper consideration. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. The Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, I move that so much of the standing and sessional orders be suspended as would prevent the Leader of the Opposition from moving the following motion forthwith. That this House censures the Prime Minister and the Treasurer for their inept and incompetent economic and financial management since coming to office, and in particular failing to react responsibly and effectively to the global financial crisis, establishing an unlimited free deposit guarantee scheme which, in the words of the Reserve Bank Governor himself, is creating serious dislocation in the financial system, ignoring the warning of the Reserve Bank Governor when he wrote to the Treasury Secretary last Friday that we have been going around and around on this, but I think we need to get something out to the market soon, e expediting the passage through the Parliament of a deposits guarantee law which at the very moment the Treasurer delivered his second reading speech he knew but did not say was misconceived and in need of drastic amendment, 
announcing in the course of question time yesterday a new deposits tax which would impose a massive cost increase on Australian banks, a cost they would seek to recover by increased interest rates and fees. When the global financial instability became a crisis, failing to directly consult the Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia on a central element of the government's response which falls directly within the governor's responsibilities because it affects the systemic stability of Australia's financial system, and right from the beginning of this year consistently putting its short-term political strategy ahead of responsible economic management by talking up inflation and talking down the economy in the early part of 2008, thereby undermining business and consumer confidence, increasing inflationary expectations, thereby causing the Reserve Bank to increase interest rates and attempting to run the Australian economy on the basis of the 24-hour news cycle, causing the Prime Minister to develop policy on the run without due or proper evidence, proper analysis or proper consideration. Mr Speaker, what we have seen today is an urgent need, an urgent need to debate this issue. We have been calling on the Prime Minister to come into this House and debate his mismanagement of our economy. We've asked him to come in here to give a ministerial statement, to have a debate. We've sought to hold him to account, and all we have had is one stunt after another, one pick fact after another, one grand gesture after another. We saw that on the 12th of October a momentous decision was taken to guarantee all of the deposits in Australian authorised deposit taking institutions without any cap without any cap this is almost without precedent in the world the treasurer uh, said in the house the other day that germany had the same unlimited deposit guarantee well they don't mr speaker their deposit guarantee is limited to private accounts the deposit guarantee the prime minister announced was completely universal and it was inevitably going to create severe dislocation and distortions in the market. So much so that by the Treasurer's own say-so, we know that by the Wednesday, in less than 72 hours after it was announced, he was already, according to him, getting ready to change it, getting ready to install a cap. And we have had the most slippery performance about that cap trying to debate the difference between a cap and a threshold. What we've seen, plainly, is that any deposit guarantee will distort the market to some extent if you provide some classes of funds, some classes of institutions with a guarantee they obviously have an advantage that others do not. And that is why, around the world, deposit guarantees are set at levels that are designed to provide security and comfort to households and small businesses. That's why in the United States for many years it's $100,000, it's been raised to $250,000, in the UK it's £50,000 and so forth. On the Friday previously, we recommended, given the, what was clearly an increasing flow of funds to the big banks, we recommended that the deposit guarantee proposed by the government and supported by us in these times be increased from $20,000 to $100,000. The response was a classic hollow men panic over the meetings over the weekend and instead of coming to a fee to a to a level to a cap that was a reasonable one calculated to pick up household and small business accounts what did we get we got an unlimited guarantee and we have seen what it has done we have seen cash management funds we've seen any institu institutions that are not covered by the guarantee losing money to those guaranteed institutions. We've seen some funds putting a stop on redemptions. We've seen people with their savings frozen. And we know, we know that within days the Reserve Bank of Australia was saying, as I stated in the, in the uh, motion, that we have been going around and round on this. This was on the 17th of October but I think we need to get something out to the market soon. Well, it's the 23rd of October, Mr Speaker, and nothing has gone out to the markets. And we see the absurd manner in which the Treasurer, in his extraordinary incompetence, announced yesterday a new tax. 
He answered a very, sent, a very clear, very simple, comprehensible question <coughs> for him. Was the new deposits fee going to be compulsory? And he said it will apply to all deposits over the million dollar mark and it will be paid by either the bank or the depositor. And he repeated that again. He said he didn't apologise for it being compulsory. He said he wasn't going to give the banks a free kick. Oh, not the Treasurer, no. He wasn't going to do that. The Prime Minister endorsed him. And then when we asked the Prime Minister today another clear question, when is the starting date of this deposit tax going to be announced? We got a 10 minute and six second ramble and not one fact, not an answer to the question. He didn't disown the compulsory deposit tax at all, not at all. He didn't throw, he didn't throw the treasurer to the wolves. Uh, that's probably touching for the treasurer. But then in a subsequent answer from the treasurer today, there was just a little weasel word slipped in. Just a little weasel word slipped in, so now there's a bit of doubt as to whether this deposit tax will be compulsory, whether the deposit fee uh, will be a, uh, a, a tax at all. Now, we, the fact of the matter is that we know, Mr Speaker, that this agenda has been driven by a media strategy, a political strategy and nothing else. And you can see that, you can see that at its height in the nearly two hours of this House's time that was taken up today with the absurd motions from the member for Graindler. Now, the Prime Minister is, uh, is, loves to talk about leaving no stone unturned. It might be better to say, in his case, he leaves no cliché unuttered. And one of his, one of his favourite, favourite clichés today is letting loose the dogs of war. Well, there is, no, there is no snappier dog of war than the member for Graindler. And he was in here, full of indignation, taking up two hours of the parliament's time because he was concerned about the reputation of Dr Henry, so it was said. Now, Mr Speaker, the record shows I did not call for Dr Henry to be dismissed. I spoke, I spoke as warmly of Dr Henry as his greatest admirers could, and yet we had the ridiculous, indeed tragic, example of this government, led by the ultimate control freak, proceeding with a motion, Mr Speaker, not by the book, not by the standing orders, but by the little red book of Chairman Mao. He wanted, he wanted to call a, they, they passed a resolution, put it through with their majority, to call a member of parliament to say certain words. They haven't censured. They haven't censured the leader of the opposition. They haven't condemned the leader of the opposition. They passed a motion to say that the Leader of the Opposition should utter certain words. Now, that is, that is by the book. It is certainly by the book. It's not the standing orders. It's not Magna Carta. It's not the Constitution. Yes, it's the little red book. The members, my colleagues write, it's the little red book. And, of course, there they are, the gang of four. Comrade Kev, Comrade Wayne, Comrade Albo. Ah, oh, yes, and Madam Julia. There she is. There they are. That's the gang of four. We've, we've, it's fine for the Prime Minister to embrace Asian values, but I don't think we should start with the Red Guards and the Little Red Book of Chairman Mao. Because, messy and disconcerting though it may be, we live in a democracy, and this is a parliament, and we have a right to debate these issues, Mr Speaker, and we will. And no control freak Prime Minister is going to be able to silence the opposition take his activities away Order. from the scrutiny of the press, Order. deny the, the people Honourable their Member's say. time has expired. Is the motion seconded? The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I second this motion. The consequences of the Prime Minister's hasty and ill-considered decision to provide an unlimited deposit guarantee are not abstract consequences. They are not abstract. The consequences are being felt by Australians across this country every day since the 12th of October, and that is why we need to debate this matter now in this House. The Prime Minister has refused to come into the House in accordance with precedent to give a Prime Minister's Prime Ministerial statement on one of the most important and significant decisions that a government has made in a long time. And yet this Prime Minister has refused 
to even grace the parliament with his presence to speak about the decision made on the 12th of October, which is now having such serious consequences in financial markets across this country. This decision has caused massive confusion in the financial markets. As at the 12th of October, when the Prime Minister announced this unlimited guarantee on bank deposits, there has been a massive movement of funds from those excluded from the guarantee into those institutions that are included in the guarantee. And let me take one example that was provided in evidence today, in evidence today to Senate estimates by officers of APRA. They were asked about the fact that the government's decision has created two classes of institutions within the APRA regulated authorised deposit taking institutions. What the government has done is exclude the foreign bank branches. Foreign bank branches are APRA regulated. They are right. authorised deposit taking institutions. And yet the government has excluded the foreign bank branches from their unlimited guarantee. And guess what has happened? As of the 13th of October, billions of dollars, and this is evidence <coughs> from APRA officers, billions of dollars of funds have moved from the foreign bank branches that were APRA regulated. They were authorised deposit taking institutions under the laws of this country and they have moved them into the banks included in the government's guarantee. Now, what this has meant is that the funds, and we're not talking about abstracts here, we're not talking about some foreign investments here. What we're talking about are the funds, the investments and the savings of ordinary Australians because these institutions hold aggregate funds. They hold pools of investments and savings from mums and dads and small businesses and superannuants and self-funded retirees across Australia. And because these banks were left out of the guarantee, they believed that they could not offer the confidence to these people that banks with the guarantee could offer, so they have moved billions of dollars of these people's money into those banks included in the guarantee. Okay, so what happens yesterday? At 2.23 p.m., the Treasurer, in answer to a question about a fee he'd mentioned the day before—he wasn't talking about a fee in his second reading speech. That is rewriting history. He didn't mention a fee in his second reading speech on the 15th of October. What happened yesterday is that the Treasurer announced a new and compulsory deposit tax on all the deposits that are now in the banks included in the guarantee. The Treasurer made a fundamental mistake, of course, as he has in so many answers to so many questions. He said it would apply to all deposits in APRA-regulated institutions, but in actual fact he forgot that he's already excluded some APRA-regulated authorised deposit-taking institutions from his guarantee. But OK, we've now got billions of dollars of funds that have flowed in from the 13th of October into particularly the big four banks and other banks. The Treasurer announces a new tax. Well, I've now been contacted by asset managers who say they want to take the money out of the big banks because they don't want to attract a fee which would be passed on to their deposit holders. They want to take the money out of the bank. Is that an intended consequence to take money, to take deposits out of the big banks? Was that an intended consequence of the announcement of a new tax? Or are these people stuck with paying the tax that was announced at 2.23 p.m. yesterday? Well, the Treasurer hasn't resolved from that. The Prime Minister took 10 minutes to answer a question, and not once did he say that this tax was not compulsory, nor did he say that it wouldn't apply from 2.23 p.m. yesterday. So the Australian public must assume that this new tax on their deposits, when they were told that it was going to be free of charge for the guarantee, they now find that their savings will be subject to a new tax. I ask the Prime Minister, does this mean that the savings of ordinary Australians will now be diluted by Order. the fact that they must Order. The pay Honourable this Member's tax? time has expired. The question is the motion be agreed to the Prime Minister. Thanks very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I noted with um, some uh, keen interest the statement by the Leader of the Opposition today in reference to the Secretary of the Treasury. He said that his remarks about the Secretary of the Treasury at the dispatch box the other day 
were the warmest remarks that could be made of Dr Henry as he could. The warmest <laughs> remarks he could make of De Dr Henry as he could. It's strange when you make such warm remarks that in the process of this extension of warmth, you then threaten to sack them. That is a strange expression of warmth in uh, the part of the world that I come from. And can I just say to the Leader of the Opposition that um, whether it's the Secretary of the Treasury, whether it's the Governor of the Reserve Bank, whether it's uh, ASIC, whether it's the other regulators, the importance of the independence of these financial institutions goes to this country's long-term economic interests. And what we have had here instead from Malcolm Turnbull is a man prepared to slur our economic institutions during a global financial crisis just to pursue his own personal political interests. What we have had here is arrogance. What we have had here is recklessness. What we have had here is a lack of control. For some time we have said in this place that the Leader of the Opposition is out of touch. Remember what he has said about interest rates, a mere 25 basis point in increase in interest rates, something which people have become over-dramatised about. Well, that's out of touch. But what we've seen something uh, remarkable in the last week is not just out of touch behaviour, but in fact behaviour which is out of control. Prime Minister, Prime Minister would you order the Prime Minister to resume his seat. Order the member for Sturt on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, with due respect, the suspension motion is very clear in its terms. This would have been relevant to a motion if the government order. had the guts to bring a censure motion order against the leader of the opposition, the but it hasn't. Member and for Sturt will resume his seat. The member for Sturt will resume his seat. The, mo the debate has been a fairly wide uh, suspension of standing order debate. The Prime Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. But the underlying principle in all of this is that at a time of global financial crisis, does Australia, do the men and women of Australia, the working families of Australia, want to have confidence that we have an independent Secretary of the Treasury, an independent Governor of the Reserve Bank, an independent ASIC, an independent Prudential Regulatory Authority. Do, we want the, do the Australian people want to have confidence in those institutions? Yes, they do. Do they want to have the alternative government of Australia simply taking out the machete and trying to hack them down at every opportunity? And that is exactly what the Leader of the Opposition has given his sanction to. He smiles there as if this is of some small passing matter. I would say to the Leader of the Opposition, in, in his attack on the Secretary of the Treasury, he has failed the first and fundamental character test for occupying the Prime Ministership of Australia. This is an Australian institution. It should be beyond political and partisan attack. The Reserve Bank is an Australian institution. It should be beyond political and partisan attack, a principle which the Leader of the Opposition does not grasp. The weekend uh, before last, Mr. Speaker, the world was beset with the global financial crisis, which was getting right out of control. If you looked at what happened at stock markets on the previous Friday, the massive collapse across the world, what you saw was stocks plummeting, credit markets out of control, credit markets drying up, but beyond that, the visible sapping of confidence on the part of deposit holders around the nation as they became concerned about the security of their deposits. That was the real problem that the government of Australia, democratically elected, was dealing with. And that is why we sat down with our regulators to work out what to do about it. And we met for that weekend. We took decisions. We took tough decisions. We took hard decisions. Our decisions were decisive and taken with this core interest in mind how to provide security and confidence for the working men and women of Australia, those in the gallery here today concerned about the security of their deposits, and what about the future also of their banks and their ability to provide funding for the future for loans to business. These were the concerns which drove the government. Those were the concerns which drove the regulators. That's why we spent the entire weekend working here, and we acted and we are proud of the decisions we took. Mr Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition does not understand the depth of the crisis that we are in, because he has said that this crisis is simply mere hype. His word, not ours. His word, not ours. Therefore, therefore when the superannuation policyholders of Australia, the 10 million of them, are concerned about the impact of stock market collapses on the earnings of those funds, he is saying that they are simply responding to hype. 
He is saying to those pensioners out there who are in need of extra support at this time that they are responding to mere hype. He is saying that those concerned about the security of their deposits in banks were responding to mere hype. Can I say to the alternative Prime Minister of Australia, fear and anxiety are not the product of hype. Fear and anxiety are the product of the events that they have saw unfold across their television screens across the world, and they were looking for governments and responsible political parties to show leadership and to act. This government did so. This government is proud of the action that it took, necessary to deal with the reality of the crisis that we were confronted with. And if you look at the response across the business community, you look at the response across the banks of Australia, you look at the response in terms of what the regulators have said about the actions we have taken subsequently, it is quite clear that the decisions taken by the government on that critical weekend were absolute and necessary in the interests of the working men and women of this country, of retirees, of superannuants, as well as those needing loans if they're out there in small business. Not just that action on deposits, the action also for the term funding arrangements for our major retail banks, and on top of that, of course, a $10.4 billion economic security strategy for the future, delivering additional help and support for pensioners, for families, and to assist those out there in the hard business of trying to fund the purchase of their first home. Mr Speaker, that is our policy. We stand by it and we are proud of it. What is the policy of the Alternative Government of Australia on the guarantee on deposits? What is it? Five times last night on television, and they all bury their heads at this moment. Five times Order. on television last night, the alternative Prime Minister of Australia was asked this Order. question: What is your policy on guaranteeing the deposits Order. of the, the men and the women of Australia? What is it? The member for Dixon. Because the member for what Dixon. those opposite have said Order. and confirmed most recently depending on who you listen to on what Member day, is it may be a $100,000 limit, maybe not, depending on the weather, depending on the day, depending on the spokesman. I would say to the Leader of the Opposition, the Australian people want certainty at this time. They have a clear decision from us, which is to provide certainty of guarantee of deposits for the future. That is our policy. We have announced it, we stand by it and we defend it, and it is supported Member by the regulators. Goldstein. We turn to the alternative government of Australia, and they don't only just walk both sides of the street, but when challenged repeatedly to name a number, name a limit, name a condition, they cannot do so. I would say Member to the opposition, again if he Member seeks to Dixon. occupy the Prime Ministership of this country, having a clear position on something as basic to the mums and dads of Australia as whether or not their deposits are going to be secure in the bank is the first ask of leadership, a test of leadership. The Leader of the Opposition has failed. Mr Speaker, the government has also been acting domestically and internationally, because in terms of dealing with the confidence crisis which exists across our country and beyond, we are dealing with the problem of financial regulation at home and abroad. We are dealing with the problem of economic growth at home and abroad and jobs. We are also dealing with the harmonisation of policies across the globe. And across the last week, Mr. Speaker, together with the Foreign Minister, together with the Treasurer, together with the Trade Minister, the Government of Australia, apart from attending to these matters domestically, has been engaged in every capital in the world, through our embassies and directly, in ensuring that we would have a place at the table for Australia to argue our case for the future financial order of the world. Yeah. The decision announced this morning Australian time by President Bush to convene a G20 meeting in Washington, a group of 20 meeting in Washington at heads of government level, is in direct response to the representations by this government and other governments around the world. Yeah. There were those in the international community who argued that the G7 Remember alone could that. handle this challenge. Our argument, looking at the Asia-Pacific region and looking at the significant economies here, is that if we are to deliver a global solution to this problem, it requires a global response. Australia will be arguing internationally for an effective response, just as we've been arguing a decisive case through our actions here at home. This government stands up for the long-term economic interests of the economy. We stand up for the long-term interests of the families within the economy. We stand up for the interests of those deposit holders who are here in the gallery in parliament today. We stand up for pensioners. We stand up for families doing it tough, for those who are seeking to buy their first home. That is the hallmark of a government exercising proper leadership in the midst of a global financial crisis. I would suggest Order. that those opposite supported Order. the government. The time for the debate has expired.
The question is the suspension of standing and sessional orders moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion for the suspension of standing and sessional orders moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Ryan, 
and Riverina Tellers for the eyes, members for Hindmarsh and Shortland Tellers for the nose. Order the result of the division is ayes 57, noes 77. The question is therefore negatived. negatived. <laughs> the Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Order. Would members please resume their places quickly and quietly? Or if they're leaving the chamber, do so even quickly. Uh, quicker. Order. The Leader of the House. Speaker, I have a question to you. Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, earlier today in the House of Representatives, while I was at the dispatch box, I was approached uh, from behind no by— The Leader of the House has the call. Thanks, Mr Speaker. Early, earlier today in the House of Representatives, while at the dispatch box, I was approached from behind by the member for Warringah— Order. Who, who, Order. Who, Order. Who, Order. 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 The House will come to order. If the House would be quiet, I think we can get this over and done with fairly quickly. The Leader of the House. Who made numerous uh, interjections and, order. And, and threatening comments. Can I ask? Can I order. ask? Can I ask, Mr Speaker, as you were not in the chair at the time, to consult with the uh, member for Hughes, who was in the chair at the time, and examine the tape and uh, report uh, back to the House at a future time in Order. accordance with whether it is appropriate for any further action to be taken? Order. Order. I'll deal with this very quickly. Order. Order. I will deal with this very quickly if the House just I'll make firstly four comments. One that wasn't really a question to me at this time because it's questions about administration, so I'm trying to be consistent about that. Two, 
I will not look at the tape because I'm trying to be consistent about that. I'm going to get to three and I can't remember what four is. <laughs> three, the member of the, the, three, the member of the speaker's panel has my utmost confidence of the way that she conducted the proceedings at the time. The fourth point is that on the basis that I'm able to confidently say that is because I happened to be watching at the time. The ruling that the Deputy Speaker made at the time was a legitimate ruling for her. Un if the two ministers want me to deal with this, they will remain quiet because I would not wish them to preempt what I'm about to say because I may not say it. I have said that I will not be reviewing tapes. But what I'm about to say might cause the member for Warringah a little grief. I am confident because I'm to make the statements I've made about the member of the speaker's panel because at the time I was watching. And the problem for the member for Warringah was that if it had simply been just the vision that I had to base a conclusion on, I would have left the matter at this point. Regrettably for him, and this is not saying that the Deputy Speaker would not have heard what was said, may not have heard what was said, there was a live mic. He did make one comment audibly that it probably would assist the Chamber if he now withdrew that remark. Speaker, I appreciate your comments and I'm happy to withdraw. I thank the member for Warringah. Well uh, no, the member for the member for Hume will wait for my bit, then I'll give him a go, all right? All right. Order. But I just want to order yesterday the member for Hume raised the matter of privilege concerning comments reported to have been made about him by the New South Wales National Party leader, Mr Andrew Stoner. The member claimed that the words used by Mr Stoner represented a threat against him and an attempt to interfere with his ability to perform his duties as a member. Any attempt to threaten a member with a view to influencing the member's performance of his or her duties as a member is a serious matter and can be punished as a contempt if it is found to constitute improper inter interference. I have examined the media articles in relation to the member of Hume's complaint. It is clear that the words reportedly used by the leader of the Nationals in New South Wales are undesirable. In the political environment, however, it is not unknown for members and other participants to, to employ hope Hyperbole and to use exaggerated or colourful language when making a point, and many such comments are not intended to be taken literally. Having re regard to the political context in which the comments were made, and to the desire over many years now that the House's power in respect to matters of contempt should be used sparingly, I am of the opinion that precedence should not be given to a motion on this occasion. I note that the member for Hume has also taken the opportunity through the media to respond to Mr Stoner.